Okay, so I guess we can start. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, EL's first webinar from uh, 2022. Uh, before we start, uh, we'll make the same announcement again. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on the EL's website, EL's social media. So by accepting to continue uh, uh, to watch our webinar and attend it, you agree with, uh, with the EEL's posting on the website and social media. Um, so tonight's topic is the pre-surgical ultrasound prediction of deep and ovarian endometriosis. Um, the presentation will be from Dr. Eliana Montanari from uh, um, Vienna, uh, Austria, and uh, the moderator will be uh, Professor Hans Tinenberg, EEL's uh, honorary president. Um, before we uh, start with the presentation, we would like to thank our um, sponsor, Gedon Richter, and uh, therefore we'll um, play a short video. What does it take to make a medicine? You need to shift your perspective to see success comes from a series of innovations. Without the dedicated work of our highly trained researchers, no such progress would be possible. It is today that experts need to think about the diseases of tomorrow, mm -hmm. and premium quality requires the latest technology. All these aspects come together to create new treatments that will improve the health of millions. This is what we work for every day. Gideon Richter, health is our mission. Okay, so now it's my honor to welcome our tonight's moderator, EL's president, uh, Professor Hans Tinenberg, who uh, is, doesn't need any further presentation. He's uh, been uh, for more than 15 years director in the OBGYN clinic in Gießen in Germany. He's uh, at the moment the head of the minimal invasive um, surgery department in Norwest Hospital in Frankfurt. And he's also the scientific director of the uh, Academy of the Medical Chamber in Hessen in Germany. Um, so thank you for having you tonight here. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful for um, being allowed to moderate this outstanding presenter tonight, which is Iliana Montanari. Uh, she has um, many awards, uh, one that I had to look up um, the, uh, <clears throat> the internet for finding out what the Promotio Sub Auspices Presidentis Republica is, but um, I, I deeply bow my head uh, in front of you for this uh, very particular award, which um, is very outstanding. And that leads me to the point <clears throat> that I think EL is extremely happy and honored to see that also young outstanding people are contributing to ER contents. Talking about what you are presenting, this is a fascinating topic because it's not only ultrasound and diagnosis, but it's also prediction. So I think you will have your crystal ball showing us uh, what uh, you can see with, um, with your ultrasound machine. Um, so please uh, start your presentation by sharing the screen, and afterwards we will have uh, question and answer sessions. Okay, then uh, good evening to everyone, and um, thank you for, for this invitation. I'm really happy to uh, have the opportunity to talk about this topic, which I uh, like very much, and it's I think it's it's really important and interesting. So um, first of all, why is an accurate um, ultrasound evaluation of a patient with suspected endometriosis important, both um, in uh, with respect to the diagnosis and also uh, preoperatively? Well, um, until now, diagnostic laparoscopy has been considered to represent the gold standard for the diagnosis of endometriosis, as still stated by um, different um, guidelines. However, it's an invasive procedure with associated um, risks for the patients also. And um, so the aim should be to replace it um, by non-invasive diagnostics um, methods. So for example, um, by sonography. In particular, in the light of this new um, technical development, 
developments in the field of um, ultrasound, this is getting more and more possible. And um, yeah, with, with um, an accurate preoperative ultrasound evaluation, uh, an adequate planning of the surgery is possible, including adequate patient information and preparation. So you can tell a patient exactly what is expected uh, to be found at surgery and which procedure you are uh, going to choose or which options there are. Uh, you can plan also the involvement of a neurologist or general surgeon if needed and depending on the, on the center. And um, it should help to avoid incomplete and repeated surgeries. And the most important point of all is that you should have an accurate um, diagnosis of the extent and location of endometriosis in order to never be surprised by the interoperative situation that you find them. The second question is why using transvagina sonography for this diagnosis? This is because it is considered to be the first line imaging modality for the diagnosis of endometriosis, including deep endometriosis. And this because it is cost-effective, widely available, non-invasive, and it has been shown to be very accurate in the detection of endometriotic um, lesions in different locations. The diagnostic approach should be, first of all, an exact patient history taking. Here you get also uh, clues for um, the ultrasound examination also, um, to where to look uh, with more, yeah, more precisely to, to um, search for um, deep endometriotic lesions that may also be really small, but um, annoying for the patient. Then you should do the speculum examination for, um, for direct visualization of uh, endometriotic lesions, in particular in the posterior fornix and uh, palpation. And then you should uh, go on and do um, sonography. First of all, 2D um, TVS with tenderness guided sonography. That means that the, the patient could have some area uh, which uh, hurts if you um, slightly push with the ultrasound probe. And if you um, assess this area in particular, you could find also really small um, lesions that otherwise you might overlook. Additionally, um, then you should use 3D TVS for, um, for example, for uh, the evaluation of adenomyosis and uh, transabdominal sonography. If, for example, you look for an endometriotic lesion in uh, uh, a previous cesarean scar, for example, or uh, for bowel um, uh, evaluation. And only if needed, you can do additional examinations such as MRI, uh, which, uh, are, which is considered as a second line imaging modality. And um, what is important to say both for sonography and for MRI, it is important that it, should, it, um, that it is carried out by an experienced, an experienced sonographer or gynecologist, um, the TVS, because otherwise you will miss some lesions. And also for the M MRI, which is maybe less known, but if you do it anywhere, with, um, um, with any radiologist doing it without any particular experience in endometriosis, you may lose time and uh, money because you can't use um, the findings that you find that you to get there. So which um, locations can be evaluated by endometriosis? Um, we will see that later and also how accurate this is. Um, on one hand, uh, endometriotic cysts of the ovaries, which are the most common uh, findings. Then adhesions, which are not um, directly uh, visualized, but they're indirect signs that you can um, see. Peritoneal lesions, uh, that's a limitation of TBS because you can't exclude the presence of um, mere peritoneal lesions in a patient just with sonography. Uh, then adenomyosis, in particular with 3D uh, ultrasound, can be well evaluated, and um, deep endometriosis. Deep endometriosis of the urinary bladder and of the ureters, which should also be routinely evaluated, always um, of the vagina, rectovaginal septum, sacroiliac ligaments, parametria, rectum, segment colon, and then more... Um, uh, more rare uh, localizations such as the appendix or the abdominal wall. 
The main limitations of fluid ultrasound evaluation are the assessment of peritoneal endometriosis, as said before, also the estimation of the extent of parametrial disease, in particular, if there is involvement of um, sacral uh, roots, then uh, an MRI should be performed to better evaluate it. Uh, evaluate it. Um, also, if there is a suspicion of uh, multifocal bowel involvement, um, and of course, for the evaluation of some, some rare locations such as, uh, as um, the lungs and the brain, which can be, of course, evaluated by sonography, but also for the diaphragm, it's um, useful. And in general, if you have a patient that has clear symptoms uh, of endometriosis and uh, TBS is negative, an MRI should be performed, and also if TBS is uh, inconclusive. So now we can um, go to the different uh, localizations. First of all, the well-known endometriomas with their, um, their um, typical ground glass appearance in premenopausal women and the um, little or even absent um, vascularization on uh, ultrasound. Uh, what has to be, um, um, one has to bear in mind with uh, endometriomas if uh, he or she finds them on ultrasound is that in 20% of cases, there's also deep endometriosis associated. So if you find it, always look for deep endometriosis in um, this patient. Although the diagnosis of endometriomas is normally easy, there can be some challenging cases, for example, um, in the case of decidualized endometriomas in pregnancy. Um, this is a nice uh, image from a colleague from uh, the University of, of uh, Parma, Martino Rolla, um, where we can see a decidualized endometrioma, which could be um, yeah, somehow um, yeah, more difficult. It's, it might be more difficult to differentiate it from a malignant process because you see um, these um, papillary projections here, the smaller ones, and here the big one. The big one is also um, a little bit vascularized uh, in a color Doppler, but um, um, the, the mean findings in these decidualized endometriomas in contrast to malignant um, ovarian cysts is that they are rounded um, papillary projections and they have a smooth um, contour. So smooth borders, these um, projections. Of course, if you have something like this, better uh, send it to expert sonographers to evaluate it. Um, it is useful to have uh, anamnestic endometriomas before pregnancy, of course, that will help you to differentiate it. And normally these um, regress during pregnancy and postpartum. Then the next thing is to check um, ovarian mobility. This, um, can give you some clues about uh, the presence of adhesions in, um, in the area of the ovaries and tubes. So you can assess this, um, assess the mobility by gently pushing with the probe and with the hand from the abdomen. So here you see uh, a an, uh, an freely gliding uh, tissue around the ovaries. So it's, um, it's moving regularly the ovary. You see here there, that there are no adhesions to little endometriomas, but no adhesions. For adenomyosis, uh, the MUSA criteria should be uh, used. Uh, these are an asymmetry between the anterior and the posterior uterine wall, myometrial cysts, hyperechogenic uh, islands in the myometrium, a fan shaped shadowing, uh, echogenic subendometrial uh, lines and knosps a typical translesional vascularization. And uh, on 3D in the coronal plane, you can um, see the irregular or interrupted junctional zone. This is a typical image of um, an adenomyotic uterus with a much thicker posterior wall um, compared to the anterior wall. You have also this uh, fan-shaped uh, shadowing and um, myometrial cysts. This is another sign that can be found in adenomyosis um, and with um, uh, adhesions, uterine adhesions, the question mark sign, it is called like that because it resembles a question mark. So uterus does this, this curves, it goes anteriorly and then um, 
uh, again, posteriorly. For the evaluation of deep endometriosis, uh, there is a, an idea consensus statement that also proposes a systematic evaluation, not only of deep endometriosis, but of endometriosis in general, in order not to forget um, anything. So these four steps that are proposed could also be um, evaluated in another order, but the important thing is to uh, assess everything of it and not to forget anything. So first uh, point is the assessment of the uterus and adnexa, which we, which we already saw. Then of soft markers, the variable mobility and the site-specific tenderness. Then the third thing is the sliding sign. We will see that later. This is a sign to evaluate whether um, there are adhesions uh, posterior to the uterus, in particular to the bowel. So this is a clue to search for also um, bowel endometriosis. And uh, the fourth point, the e lesions. So lesions of the urinary bladder and the ureters of the vagina, rectovaginal septum, sacroiterine ligaments, parametria, rectum, and sigmoid colon. So you can start from the urinary bladder and um, end up with the rectum. For the urinary bladder, it's good to have it uh, filled a little bit, but it should not be completely full. So you can better evaluate it. Um, I will tell you later. So um, first of all, you can start with the uterovesical region. Uh, you evaluate whether the urinary bladder can be um, can can slide freely um, towards the, the the uterine wall, the anterior wall. So you push again a little bit with the probe, and you see that it slides away in this case. So here there aren't any adhesions between the uterus and the um, Urine, um, urinary bladder. Here um, you see an example of a deep endometriotic lesion of the urinary bladder here in the longitudinal view and here in the uh, transverse plane. What is important now, if you see a lesion of the a deep endometriotic lesion of the urinary bladder, for surgery, it is very important to see um, the location, the exact location and size of the lesion and uh, the distance to the ureteral ostium. So if you see it, you have to measure uh, in centimeters, millimeters, um, the distance, for example, if it is located here to the ure ureteral ostium, because um, that might um, um, that has an influence uh, on the fact whether you can just uh, cut the lesion out or you have to do, for example, a ureter reimplantation. And the second thing that is very important is to check whether there's ureteral involvement by uh, the lesion and ureteral obstruction. For ureteral obstruction, um, you can, it can be said that the ureters can be followed um, by TVS until about two to, or three centimeters above the, the um, crossing with the uterine um, artery. And uh, you can see whether there is a dilation in this uh, area. Um, so until this point. And what also have, has to be checked always if you have, have um, deep endometriosis, not also of the bladder, but in general, is um, to do an abdom transabdominal scan of the kidneys in order to see whether there is hydronephrosis because this can be uh, asymptomatic and lead to kidney damage and um, in the worst of cases to uh, loss of renal function. So here is um, a surgical um, video. I showed one from my colleague Gernot Tudelis from Vienna. Here you see a deletion of the bladder that was resected. And here you can see the ureteral ostium that is uh, um, sufficiently um, uh, distant to the um, to this uh, lesion to this nodule in order to not to have to do uh, additional um, procedures during um, surgery in this case. Here is another um, bladder de lesion, a big one. And um, you see in this case, we'll see it now, that the ureter, which is here and can be followed over the crossing with the uterine artery, 
is running through this lesion. Yeah? But even if it's running here, you see that it's not dilated. So if you see that again, it's narrow until here and where it can be, be seen. Nevertheless, always check the kidneys as said before. Then a normal ure ureter, we see it here again with a jet into the urinary bladder. So you can also um, check the function of the ureter. And here in contrast to it, uh, you see here's a bladder. Here you will see now um, a dilatation of the ureter here. So this is clearly visible uh, on TBS. And by the way, you can also see um, some ureter, um, some concrements in the ureters. Then if you have checked the urinary bladder and the ureters, you pass to a uh, next step, the sliding sign um, here. Um, you uh, again push slightly with a uh, probe from here and push with the other hand from the abdomen. And in this case, it is positive. So you see that the surrounding tissue, in particular bowel, slides freely over the posterior wall of the uterus. So here there are no adhesions. In the next video, you see it a little bit exaggerated in, in, in order to, to show it better how also the, the fundus is free of any adhesions um, in this area. In contrast to it, here you see a negative sliding sign. So it is clear that here there are um, massive adhesions in this patient between the surrounding tissue, in this case, the bowel, uh, to the uterus. It doesn't slide at all um, um, along the, the uterus. And this was a patient with a frozen pelvis then at um, surgery. Here are some examples then uh, of um, deep endometriosis of the rectum. So you, you see here uh, different um, uh, bowel um, deep endometriotic lesions also with retractions of um, bowel loops in some cases. What is important here for surgery for um, deep endometriosis of the rectum, um, again, you should evaluate the size of the bowel lesion. And in this case, also the distance to the anal vert, because it has been shown that the risk of anastomotic leakages is uh, much higher if the anastomosis is below five centimeters anal. And here you see the laparoscopic um, view of all, um, a lesion of the sacro-uterine lig um, ligaments, this one, and also in this image. And here an addition uh, cyst with a amorphic um, material in it. So this was in the part of Douglas. Um, yeah, then we wanted to say in, um, yeah, um, in many studies have shown um, the, the high diagnostic accuracy of transvaginal ultrasound for the non-invasive diagnosis of bowel endometriosis, also for other sites. Endometriosis, there are really many, many, many um, reviews uh, and uh, studies uh, telling that. We also performed um, a study, a, retro, a retrospective study in uh, one center um, in Avellino in Italy with the colleagues um, Alessandro Giovanni and Mario Malzoni, where we um, uh, checked uh, the, the sensitivities and specificities of the detection of um, deep endometriotic uh, lesions and also of lesions of the ovaries and um, of adhesions. Um, 
in uh, patients who underwent uh, sonography and then a sur surgery for deep endometriosis in the center. And we found again sensitivities between 86 and 100 percent, with 100 percent in most locations, and specificities between 86 and 100 percent. What we also checked was um, the exact measurements in millimeters between ultrasound evaluation and surgery. And this was really, yeah, um, I mean, really su surprising even uh, because there were uh, very high exact findings. So zero mi millimeter of difference between ultrasound and surgery. And if you consider tolerance mar margin of three millimeters, which is really low and clinically not really significant, you have um, um, rates always in different locations over 90%. So NCN C is, uh, for example, the rectum, um, NCN B on the right side and left side are the uterosacral um, ligaments, or NCN compartment NCN E uh, is the vagina and rectovaginal septum. This is a little 80%. But if you uh, consider a tolerance margin of one centimeter, then you reach most um, 100%. Um, then, based on this um, sort of pilot study, we uh, wanted to uh, check the accuracy of sonography for this non invasive detection of ovarian deep endometriosis using the enzyme classification in a multi center um, um, study, an international study with seven participating tertiary um, referral centers centers for endometriosis. Um, we could include 745 patients in the study. And again, we see very high sensitivities and uh, specificities. And what we also saw uh, was when we um, again looked for the uh, sizes of the endometriotic lesions, this time considering the severity grades of um, of um, the, the NCN classification, then we see um, for that there's no difference between ultrasound and surgery. So in the, in the severity grade, in uh, more than 90% in, um, for the ovaries and always, almost always uh, over 80%. Uh, and if we take no difference and only one severity grade difference between uh, ultrasound and, um, and surgery, then we reach almost 100% and always more than 90% of, um, yeah, of cases. So this shows that it's really very, very um, accurate, the, the um, sonographic evaluation not only of the presence, but also of the size of the endometriotic lesions. And the only thing is here in enzyme compartment uh, T, these are the, the tubo variant units of the tubes and the ovaries. Uh, there, it's a little bit more difficult to say exactly whether they are uh, only um, 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 slight adhesions or moderate adhesions or if these are moderate adhesions or severe adhesions. But it never happened uh, that uh, no adhesion was seen at ultrasound and then you had severe adhesions at surgery, for example. And also uh, it almost never happened um, to see slight adhesions and to have them severe adhesions. So even that, even if, if this subjective evaluation, it works uh, well with ultrasound. So in conclusion, was it important? TVS shows very high sensitivities and specificities for the detection of endometriosis, including deep endometriosis, and also the extent can be very well evaluated. TVS should be used for the planning of the surgery and selected cases. MRI can be used as second line imaging technique. Both should be done by experts in uh, these techniques. And the accurate preoperative determination of disease location and extent is essential in order to never be surprised by the interoperative situation. So whether you use ultrasound or MRI, you should always 
have an accurate picture of what you will find. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we cannot applaud you because this would um, stretch uh, the, uh, the possibilities of Zoom too much. But this has been a very educative and very uh, structured uh, presentation. And thank you also for mentioning the comparison or, or the integration of the Encian score, which is a very important tool to exactly describe endometriosis. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we can see that it is congruent with uh, the ultrasound and the, the finding uh, during surgery. Concerning surgery, I think it might be helpful that you also are deeply involved in endoscopic surgery, at least that's what I found uh, in your CV in the internet, that you're also part of the skills group. Do you think it helps you um, find and describe uh, and uh, evaluate the, the, the ultrasound pictures that you get? Well, um, actually I started um with, uh, yeah, I loved um, laparoscopy and I was fascinated by, um, by endoscopic surgery. And then uh, I found out about the ultrasound and um, I think this is another world you can um, learn. And it is really very, um, very useful um, to, to do um, the test and to see then what you find at surgery. And um, yeah, if some Um, the ultrasound part, and then uh, the surgeon looks at the images and reads the report and uses it. It's also fine, um, but uh, you personally have also, yeah, it's 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 better for you if if you are a surgeon to to also do the ultrasound. At least that's my my own opinion. Well, thank you very much. I, I think you're absolutely right, but that's the point to stress. It is best that you can do everything yourself. Now, concerning the correlation between ultrasound finding and uh, laparoscopic or surgical finding, there are some questions. And one is um, concerning the paper that you, you cited with, um, uh, with uh, Di Giovanni. So that is, how were the endometriotic lesions intraoperatively and postoperatively measured in the papers from you and Giovanni macroscopic or extra abdominally, histologically? Yeah, um, well, uh, it has to be said that this was uh, the pilot study, more or less. So that was a re retrospective study. Um, the uh, ultrasound findings, uh, the measurements were in, in exact millimeters. So seven, eight, nine, ten 10 millimeters and so on, um, like always. And um, the interoperative um, measurements were in uh, uh, five millimeter steps. So this was um, recorded five millimeter, 10 millimeter, 15 and so on. Uh, and uh, this was done um, interpretive series. So not on the resected lesions, but on the inside lesions, which is um, the correspondence to the, um, uh, to the ultrasound. Because if you, for example, resect um, a piece of bowel, so do segmental resection, for example, and then you uh, cut the bowel, then often the lesion becomes longer because you artificially, yeah, <laughs> change that. So you can't, um, yeah, measure it like this and then, uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, compare it to the ultrasound with, of course, measures the, the, the lesion like it is in the patient. Yeah, yeah. But, but you can also refold it uh, the way yeah. it was uh, course, yeah. stuck together. Yeah. Well, th thank you very much. There's uh, one more question. I think people were impressed uh, by your demonstration of the ureter. And one question is, um, 
what is the the size or the extent of a normal and what is the extent of a distended ureter? In other words, when do you feel one has to speak of a distended ureter? I mean, you showed two examples, but could you also describe it in millimeters, for instance? Yeah. So normally this is um, quite clear. If you see a dilated ureter, so you will see it just um, from the appearance without even measuring it. But um, yeah, more or less in the literature, it is said that it should be about seven millimeters maximum. So if it's above this um, um, this size, then you say that it is dilated. Mm -hmm. More than seven millimeters. Yeah, normally it's it's the the cutoff. Yeah. And if it is close to the kidney, is seven millimeters also, or is it one centimeter? Well, um, this is the pylon. You know. Yeah, no, this is um, uh, the seven millimeters refers to uh, what you can see see on uh, TVS. So uh, up to okay. two to three centimeters above the crossing with the uterine artery. So that's not um, the kind of value for yeah for more proximal um, dilations. Well, thank you for for speaking about TVS. But there has been one question that is. Um, a tricky question because we know that everything has its limitation, also TVS and well, everything. So the question is with solitary nodules of the bowel. I'm absolutely convinced that um, you will see any um, deep and filtrating endometriosis of the bowel up to what distance, how many centimeters, let's say 15, 20 centimeters. Well, I would say, um, yeah, up to the sigma <laughs> with a TBS, and then including the sigma part of it, yeah, rectal sigma junction and a, a part of the sigma, and then you can uh, use transabdominal sonography. Yeah, uh, Alessandra Di Giovanni also showed that impressively. Um, yeah, she she checks uh, more or less the whole bowel with the uh, ultrasound, and um, yeah, the appendix and so on. Uh, that is more that is more difficult, of course. Um, and um, yeah, in in case you find, for example, um, uh, endometriosis of the rectum, or maybe also uh, two lesions in the rectum, then uh, you should, um, I think, um, perform an MRI, of course, again with an expert radiologist for endometriosis, in order to see whether there is um, there are also other bowel lesions in. Um, in case of multifocal um, endometriosis of the bowel. Yeah, but the, it still leaves the question, when do you recommend an MRI? Well, for the bowel now or in general? In general, in general. In general, hello. Um, yeah, in general it is. Um, first of all, if, well, ultrasound is inconclusive, if um, the patient has clear symptoms, um, of endometriosis, so you clinical would, would think uh, that you should find something and then you don't find anything at ultrasound. Then I would do the MRI and it is also recommended by um, the guidelines to do it, to, to mm -hmm. um, see whether you find it with, with the MRI. Um, also, yeah, with multifocal bowel lesions to, to see them or if, um, yeah, there's some there is suspicion for some um, lung involvement or some strange um, locations like that. So, of course, it will um, do MRI. And um, what, what did I say now? Um, there was another point. <laughs> no, I, I, it doesn't um, come again. To my... Maybe, maybe. I yeah, know no, um, for the perimetrial disease. Yeah, sorry. Because um, oh, sometimes, yeah, it is difficult to, to exactly evaluate um, the extent of the disease in the perimetria. And especially if there are some symptoms where you say, okay, maybe uh, the patient could be some, uh, could have some uh, nerve involvement with endometriosis, then you should do MRI because that's better for. Yeah. Well, the nerve involvement definitely is a very difficult uh, subject and uh, perhaps should be an extra presentation uh, yeah. during EL webinars. But um, 
do you think that um, you would have an option to visualize the involvement of sacral roots, sacral root involvement of endometriosis? You mean with uh, MRI or with vagina? No, 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 no. With, with vagina ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Difficult. You you may suspect it. Uh, to a certain extent, if um, if you see big um, parametrial nodules that are about um, this area, but you don't really see the the well the, the nerves and the, the the nodules that are really there, yeah. So just you, you can just um, suspect it if they are near to that area. But I mean, at least to what I know, it's not possible to see them like this. Well, the, the benefit of MRI is that um, contrasting fluid can be used, which yeah. is uh, impossible for ultrasound. Yeah. But uh, would, you, would you use any other uh, aids like uh, filling the bowel with, um, with fluid or gel or filling the vagina or how full should the bladder be? Yeah. Um, so for the bladder, um, it's important that it is not um, empty because otherwise you might see some mucosal foldings and think, oh, it's a nodule and it's, it's normal. And uh, on the other side, you shouldn't have a, a really full bladder because otherwise it might be um, that much extended that some small nodules are also extended and you don't really see them. So that's for the urinary bladder. Um, for a bowel, yeah, it's it's a difficult question because um, some people just do um, uh, TBS and um, then they decide whether to do a surgery just um, based on the symptoms of the patient and um, not um, really based on the um, grade of stenosis of the bowel. Some others um, do um, irigoscopy. Then there is also um, yeah, filling of the bowel with um, a saline solution. It's, yeah, I also saw that, that it's nice because you really see um, the, the lesion um, well, but I'm not sure how much this adds to uh, on, on as information. Um, yeah. Yeah, there, there are different options. The, yeah, the, what I would do if the, the patient um, reports um, rectal bleeding would be um, a rectoscopy or colonoscopy just to exclude there are some other, um, um, yeah, some other types of lesions, cancer or anything. Um, but uh, normally in endometriosis of the rectum, uh, most patients have lesions that are in the muscularis layer and don't reach the mucosa, so they don't have rectal bleeding. And um, if you perform colonoscopy, you see a normal, even a normal um, uh, rectum uh, and bowel because um, the, the nodules are on the um, exterior part and also only with, uh, yeah, real, yeah, strong stenosis or moderate stenosis, you will see it on, on, on coronoscopy. But otherwise, this exam would be uh, totally normal. Well, my, my personal experience with colonoscopy is rather disappointing. But of yeah. course, it's, it's very important uh, in order to differentiate if there's any bleeding. Um, yeah. But talking about uh, other options, uh, do, do you see any um, necessity for a rectal probe? Rectal probe. Um, what do you think is no, not necessary if you know to use your transvaginal ultrasound well? Um, I don't, I mean, you're talking about rectal uh, um, ultrasonography. A rectal, okay. Well, mm, no, I, I wouldn't um, use that for the diagnosis of rectal nodules. Um, rectal sonography can be used in patients. Um, uh, that are um, Virgo intacta, so um, you can't do a TBS in these yeah. patients, then you can switch to rectal um, sonography and you can see, yeah, see it well also by this approach. Yeah, and, and just talking about Virgos, um, 
do you have any particular protocol for adolescents with a suspected endometriosis? Mm, well, really protocols, mm, no, I wouldn't say it. Um, yeah, if you can't do a transvaginal ultrasound, then you uh, perform transrectal ultrasound and then, yeah, transabdominal ultrasound. But yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it is different. Uh, maybe, of course, yeah, you, you are a little bit even more re restrictive with surgical treatment and you may um, try um, more uh, hormonal options, but also in, in, in uh, uh, older patients, you, you should um, first try other options and then only in particular situations, some surgery. So. Yeah. And um, um, you mentioned the Enzian uh, classification. Um, one question has uh, asked whether you think, you personally think that the Enzian classification can sufficiently be described uh, by transvaginal ultrasound in order to predict the type of surgery needed. Hmm. Interesting uh, question. You can answer yes or no, if you like. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I would say it depends because, um, for example, for the urinary bladder, um, you have uh, only the, um, uh, it, it also says whether an nodule is present or not, but uh, it doesn't give you the information, for example, of the distance to the urethral ostium. So that's an additional information that you should um, look up in the report um, for uh, planning of the surgery. For um, the bowel, um, maybe yes, uh, in, in, in certain cases, for example, um, with NCN C freeze or uh, a nodule of the rectum uh, bigger than three centimeters will be most uh, probably um, treated by segmental resection rather than yeah, shaving or <laughs> discoid resection. So maybe that, um, yeah. Yes, in, in this case. Okay. So this, this has exactly been another question, whether you feel that transvaginal ultrasound will be able to predict when a disc excision or when a shaving is required. Yeah, um, well, um, Mario Malzoni from Avellino has uh, published with uh, Alessandro Di Giovanni uh, a paper on this topic recently, I think last year or so. Uh, where um, they evaluated the, the size of the lesion. So the cutoff was uh, three centimeters for the segmental resection. So it was why I mentioned that. And they also saw um, a cutoff of um, seven millimeters of um, uh, infiltration. So um, yeah, they looked that up and, and, and said what, what they would do um, between shaving and um, and this good resection versus uh, segmental resection. So uh, above seven millimeters of infiltration, they almost did um, a segmental resection and this coincided also with the three centimeters mostly. What yeah. is that? And concerning shaving, do you clearly um, describe and visualize the mucosa so that uh -huh. you can uh, judge the extent? Well, um, it can be evaluated. Yeah, um, the the um, uh, the diameter from uh, the this from the internal to the external part. Really, the mucosa is not always clear to me, at least to me. So, yeah, it's, uh, for me, it's it's still a bit difficult to to see that on ultrasound. Yeah. But that's that's also quite quite nice to hear because when when you can at your your video clips uh, it seems everything seems to be easy and open and another question has asked about the lateral uh, endometriosis of the bladder so it's not right in the center which is the the most uh, common way of infiltration of the bladder but how about lateral deep infiltrating endometriosis of the bladder. Well, it depends um, uh, how um, 
this than it is from from the real rattle uh, osteo that's the most important thing so yeah if it's lateral you can resect it um if it's uh, if it's um not too near to the ureters otherwise if it's really near then you have to think about um ureteral uh, uh reimplantation for example yeah yeah but and uh, yeah um sorry i i was thinking of um do you have a, a specific volume that you want to fill the bladder with so that you can sort of visualize or that you say i have a combination of transvaginal and abdominal ultrasound or i need to uh, uh, ask for a cystoscopy or perform it myself well um no for for the visualization it should not be completely empty so you you can do it for example like this that you let the patient um empty the bladder then you start the tbs examination do the whole examination and at the end there will be some uh, urine in the bladder so then it in most cases is um the perfect feeling um or you do it the other way around you um and do tvs and um and uh, look how full the bladder is if it's too full you send him to um them to the bladder and then you look at again at it if you have some doubt um yeah of course you can uh, do cystoscopy and um check whether um it is really an endometrial lesion also and or something else that, yeah it's the point but uh, if you have uh, a lot of endometriotic lesions um, elsewhere, the probability is high that, um, that it is an endometriotic lesion, in particular if uh, the patient doesn't have any macro hematuria or anything like that. Yeah. When, when do you use Doppler in addition to the transvaginal ultrasound, or do you always use it? I mean, you showed on your slides, you showed yeah. some, some Dopplers too. Well, I use it um, for the ovaries, of course, and yeah, sometimes if I'm in 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 doubt uh, whether or what I'm seeing, for example, in the adhesion cysts in the Douglas, to see whether this is just uh, amorphic material that has accumulated in the cyst, or uh, if it is some some uh, solid process that might be something else, for example. Yeah. Um, if you're not sure um, or you're beginning to evaluate the ureters, you can also um, help yourself with a um, color Doppler to see whether it is uh, a vessel or the ureter. So if there's no vascularization, it is the ureter. And you can also um, visualize the uterine artery so you see where the ureter crosses the uterine artery. So you yeah, highlight the, the artery in this way, for example. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I think this is also probably a, a helpful tip um, how to improve uh, the, um, the visualization of specific organs. There's one question. Uh, we, we talked about adolescence, uh, and the question has been raised again. And it says, in your experience, which type of findings did you get in adolescence endometriosis? Um, well, um, I myself did not see so many cases of, uh, adolescence, I have to say, yeah, 18 years, maybe. Yes. But, um, not so many, um, younger patients. So I, I from my own experience, I, I can't really say so much about it. I, I mean, I see sometimes, um, um endometriotic uh, cysts endometriomas but um yeah I, I, I did never see for example frozen pelvis in adolescence but yeah this experience is limited so i can't generalize yeah. it it definitely is also a very difficult question to answer because adolescence is not like adolescence so this is a, a, a quite a wide group of of patients now, since we are coming to the end of our session, and I'm very grateful to you to answer all these 
inquisitory asking you about um, uh, transvaginal ultrasound and uh, I could see that uh, Katarina Exacustus was also watching and applauding your um, your presentation which I think is is great honor for all of us um, but um, we would very much like to know for everybody watching so what is your recommendation for training in transvaginal ultrasound how do you become an expert endometriosis sonographist or sonologist okay well um you have to to see a lot of katarina yeah <laughs> <laughs> she has maybe better tips than i have <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but uh, well um yeah you have to like that to love that to uh yeah um be in a center where you see a lot of cases also um difficult cases not only cysts but um, rectal lesions, um, urinary bladder lesions, and um, at least at the beginning, you have to have someone that really, um, yeah, is an expert in this field who shows you um, the findings. Then you have to look them also up, and it's um, really useful um, to uh, preoperatively, um, yeah, perform the, the ultrasound. Then you see. Uh, what did I see on the ultrasound uh, before and what is it really um, at surgery? This is also helpful for the anatomy. And then, yeah, if you have then a certain amount of expertise, then you uh, ask Professor Exacutos and uh, she will tell you even much, much more. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. We've experienced also her proficiency in this area and we are very grateful to all of you um, including you and others who are willing to teach others. And this um, lets me uh, close this session. I think uh, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Vienna University Hospital must be very grateful to have you as a registrar and uh, to see you uh, working in your department and also with Gernot Hudelist uh, in, in his clinic. And uh, when I found out that you have close to 1,000 followers on Instagram, which, which I don't use at all, um, I wouldn't be surprised if you have more than, than this uh, after this presentation. So <laughs> thank you very much. All the best for your work. And uh, thank you for the organizers to arrange this wonderful meeting. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was really great. And thank you also for the for all the questions that were also quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hans, for your excellent moderation too. Oh. Thank you, uh, Eliana Montanari, for a very, very nice presentation. Excellent, congratulations. Thank you. A good evening to everybody. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. So who finishes? Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Good evening.